Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 115. Uh, we'll talk about persisting COVID myths and misunderstandings, which is, I think is one of the reasons why we're still stuck with uh, where we are right now and how I'm living with COVID. And partly what's prompting this is that uh, some of you know that we moved into, quote, a low orange rate here in, here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and basically it's because our hospitalization rates are, are coming back up again. I'm not so worried about the prevalence of cases, but I'm worried when we start seeing a, a higher number of hospitalizations. And we'll talk about some of the myths that I think are causing this uh, to be a persisting problem for us here, especially in the United States. So uh, here in Lincoln, Lancaster County, we went up to 47 hospitalizations uh, a day or two ago. Uh, we are, that's about a third of where we were at the Omicron peak. We we're up in the 150 range. So certainly uh, something to kind of keep an eye on. We're not red yet, but that's why we're watching this. Uh, regionally, this is uh, true across the region. It's not just a Lincoln thing. And then pretty much across the country, you'll see these rates go back up again. Uh, we're not seeing that nice summer lull like we did last time. It's already heading up uh, here in mid-July. So why, is, why are we stuck with this? And I think partly it's a problem of persisting myths understandings. So uh, one myth is the COVID shot isn't effective anymore, and that's not true. It's effective, it's just not effective against cough, runny nose, headache, fever sometimes. It's, but it is highly effective against hospitalization and deaths, more than 95% reduction. And so people are forgetting uh, a lot of vaccines don't stop all infections, but they stop severe infections, the ones that are going to be worse than, say, a cold, runny nose, and fever. So, uh, and I don't think it's all, that's just anti-vax sentiment. I think it's a lot of misunderstanding. Because a lot, a lot of them people in Lincoln got their second shot. You'll see, unfortunately, those some pretty big differences across ethnicities, especially for the black population. But across to everybody, there's a lot of people who got their second shot but are not getting their third shot, especially in the black and Hispanic population. So I think we need to improve our messaging and help people understand better what this really means. So the big reason you're getting vaccinated is not necessarily to prevent a mild infection that might give you a recurring nose or fever or headache. I'm certainly willing to prevent that too. But the biggest reason is preventing death hospitalizations and complications like long COVID. And it's high, the vaccine is highly effective against that. But you really need at least your third shot and preferably your fourth if, if indicated. So uh, you've seen this slide that I've shown before. This is from Dr. Matt Donahue, our state epidemiologist, during the Delta wave, showing that that third shot gave you a 46 times less likely risk of being infection, whereas the second shot only gave you 11 times less likely. Well, actually, now that we're in Omicron, uh, Dr. Caitlin generally posted this one uh, today, this comes from the CDC, of the effectiveness of the fourth shot. And so even with Omicron, with some breakthroughs, having all four shots, if you're older than 50, had a 42 times reduction in the risk of dying. And even going from the third to the fourth shot had a four times risk of dying. So you should get your third shot. And if you're 50, you should be, you know, after, even if you've had your third, you should be looking at your fourth. Uh, so if you want to read that post, here it is. And I've linked it to it in the notes sections. I'd highly encourage you to follow her posts because they're generally very, very good. Uh, so this uh, myth, I think, is part of the problem, that people just aren't in, uh, sort of a misunderstanding what vaccine effectiveness really means. But basically, it's around, um, the most, mostly about preventing hospitalizations and deaths and long COVID. Uh, and this is the reason, you know, from a reducing deaths, you know, uh, you've heard me say, point this out before, the ultimate uh, judge of who did things right was dead, not dead. And Lincoln Lancaster County did far better than those around us uh, in graphic form. It looks like this. And again, this goes back to vaccination rates. So if you look at our vaccination rates versus Omaha and the rest of rest of Nebraska, you'll see that that three shot vaccination rates, Lincoln, Lancaster County with the highest, Omaha, middle of the range, kind of similar to state averages, Grand Island, and then Lincoln County is actually North Platte. Uh, so uh, out here, this is Lincoln County. And so this is the mortality rate highly correlates with what we did uh, as far as masking appropriately in schools and did we mask appropriately. Uh, and unfortunately, the United States is way behind all the other countries. Even Brazil has blown past us with our third shot vaccination rate. So this is still a big problem. And why we may be stuck with and uh, having a harder time living with COVID than everybody else is we just can't get people to get that third and if indicated their fourth shot. Uh, another persisting myth I hear is that, that this assumption that natural immunity is better, and actually it's not. Natural immunity is very unpredictable. It may be uh, effective, but it might, but it frequently is not. Uh, COVID vaccine immunity is more predictable and more durable uh, for COVID, and the data has been pretty conclusive about this. Uh, so unfortunately, people who got, quote, a natural Omicron infection the first time are already getting a second Omicron infection with BA4 and 5, uh, and so the, but people with vaccinations are having more durable immunity. So, for example, this study uh, showing that BA1 wave, wave did not appear to offer protection against the newly emerging sub lineages, uh, uh, again, confirming that New York Times article, which is partly where it came from. Uh, but if you had in this article, the effectiveness of previous infection plus at least two doses of the Pfizer uh, was a little bit more effective, but having three doses plus uh, a natural infection, that gave you 77.3%. So you still need that third shot. So even if you had two shots and one infection, you actually still need that third shot. 
It's, and it's also likely to have had four, four COVID vaccines and one COVID infection than three COVID infections and two COVID vaccines. Because one of the things we're seeing is that some of the damaging effects of having coronavirus might be cumulative. So although, yes, this is a preprint study, uh, it'll, I think it will likely get uh, published, we'll find out, that reinfection attrib contributes additional risks of all-cause mortality, hospitalization, diverse health outcomes for other things uh, like, for example, lung disease, heart attacks, diabetes, for example. I have a friend who works for an insurance company, and they're actually highly worried about the long-term disability caused by repeated coronavirus infections. And so even if it doesn't, uh, the vaccines don't prevent all infections, if it only has you getting one versus say three this will protect you from the long-term damage that covid might cause so make sure you get that third and identify your fourth shot uh, another common myth is i should wait until after pregnancy to get vaccinated because there might be some long-term side effects that is completely not true the data is rock solid now that you should be getting vaccinated if you're pregnant a uh, covid vaccine is safe in pregnancy and it reduces risk for both the mom and the baby uh, the ultimate source is usually the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and they say strongly recommend, not just recommend, but strongly recommends that women compete, complete the vaccination series uh, uh, for COVID-19 while they're pregnant, not after. Uh, there's been, uh, unfortunately, we've found that there was an increase, a 22% overall, or 33% overall increase in mortality during COVID from maternal deaths. Uh, part of this is probably due to COVID. Uh, we'll, it'll take us a while to sort down how much was due to what, uh, but this is a risk for women while they're pregnant. On top of that, it's also a risk for their babies when they're born. When a woman is vaccinated while she's pregnant, she actually produces antibodies that are then given to the baby so that when the baby is born, they are partly protected by COVID. In this study, that was a 52% reduction in hospitalization. And you'll note that the two cases of infants dying from COVID, neither infant's mother had been vaccinated during pregnancy. So it's only two cases, but it should have been zero. And so we need to make sure that women are getting vaccinated while they're pregnant. Uh, there's a persisting myth that, 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 co that COVID's not that bad for kids. Well, it's not as bad as adults, but it's still worse than, say, for influenza. So I've shown this quite a few times. These are the stacked influenza deaths uh, for children uh, for the last two years, the, for the last decade uh, over similar time frames. You'll notice that the COVID mortality is far higher than the influenza mortality uh, for the entire, on, on any window you look at during the last decade. Uh, the other thing is they're, out and they're starting to find long-term COVID with kids, too. So, for example, in this study that uh, children hospitalized with COVID-19 or MISC experienced persistent symptoms or activity impairment for at least two, two months, one in four kids. So it wasn't just a one-and-done thing for them. Some of them were having persistent issues uh, over two months later. Uh, and right now, COVID is the most common vaccine-preventable cause of death in children. So try to get your, so, well, go ahead and get your vet kids vaccinated. It's safe. It's effective. Uh, that's why it's out there. Another misunderstanding is I'm waiting on my booster so I can get it this fall. Well, there's no reason to wait. You can still get a booster this fall, even if you get your third or fourth shot today. And so don't don't start holding off because there's something better coming along. It's likely that we'll be needing repeated shots. So go ahead and get your third or fourth today. And then, yes, you can still get it this fall, assuming it comes out. Uh, it's okay to get repeated doses. An example I keep using is the, the theory of tetanus and pertussis. Uh, a lot of our vaccine series li are like this, but here you, and if you've had, you've all had diphtheria, tetanus, or pertussis, you had three shots as an infant, you had a fourth shot as a toddler, a fifth shot in kindergarten, a sixth shot at, uh, once you hit seventh grade. I think at this point as a 53-year-old, I've probably had four tetanus and diphtheria boosters in my life, or 10 total diphtheria and tetanus boosters in my life. Uh, some vaccines, you just need uh, repeated vaccination. Influenza, it's annual. So it's looking like uh, coronavirus is going to be, a, in the long term, probably an annual vaccination. So there's no reason to hold off on getting that third or fourth dose and waiting for something to down the line. Uh, another myth is that Paxlovid causes COVID-19 rebound. That's actually probably not true. Uh, COVID has three phases, uh, and it's probably just that sometimes people have a rebound with cat Paxlovid or without cat Paxlovid. For example, this preprint study looking at Paxlovid versus Molnupiravir, another treatment, showed that actually the incidence was the same. And I think the people are just forgetting that COVID does rebound, but it right, but so you don't want to avoid Paxlovid because it causes rebound. It just that sometimes it it rebounds despite Paxlovid or treatment. So uh, Dr. Dan Griffin's been talking a lot about that in his post. And again, he's one of my favorite sources to keep following through. Uh, and so a lot of people have initial phase, which is that viral symptom phase. And that inflammatory phase, it happens with or without Paxlovid, with or without Molnupiravir. It just happens. Another thing that, I, I, that is a frequent frustration for both him and me, uh, 
using steroids is helpful when people are in the hospital and on oxygen the second week, but actually the studies show that if you use prednisone as an outpatient, it actually is more likely to lead you to be in the hospital to be in the hospital or death because you actually need your immune system fully effective this first week. So hopefully none of the urgent care centers out there are giving people prednisone or antibiotics or Zithromax or Ivermectin. All those are proven not to work. In the case of prednisone, it's actually been causing to more likely to kill you. So hopefully you did not go to a urgent care center that prescribed that to you. So again, my favorite uh, updates, uh, Dr. Dan Griffin on TWIV. Uh, and if you really want to full, full uh, explanations, they actually have longer ones. Uh, like, for example, the other update the following day is the full TWIV panel plus Dr. Paul Offit. So some of you may have seen, seen that there was an FDA advisory committee that voted on whether to add an Omicron component to the vaccine. Uh, they voted 19 to 2, but two voted against, one of them being Paul Offit. Uh, and if you want to hear the full, it's a pretty complicated discussion, but it's kind of interesting. So you can actually hear the depth of thinking that goes through these things. Essentially, that thought that chances are that the, the, the his, his thinking was actually that we don't need to use the Omicron because the original one's still good enough, basically. So at this point, uh, how do we live with COVID? And so I thought I'd talk about how I'm living with COVID. Uh, number one is boosters. Uh, and so I did get my fourth shot, as some of you know, and I'll probably get and I'll be getting my fifth shot likely this fall when it comes out with or without an Omicron uh, additional variant. Uh, I think basically just helps to boost your immune, your immune system to fight. And any, for me, anything that decreases the chance that I'm going to miss a trip or miss work, it's worth it to me. Uh, I'm still masking uh, at the airport. Uh, so from arrival to airport arrival to cruising altitude, I'll mask during healthcare facility. And I think during some local surges, uh, like in the schools, for example, we may be wearing those masks in the future. Um, so basically when I was last trip, airplane play, trip I took a few uh, months ago, I put my mask on while I was there, but at cruising altitude where I've got really good ventilation, I wasn't quite so worried about it. Um, and we may have wet masks in school again this year. We, uh, people are forgetting it's not just COVID has caused clues, schools to close periodically. I think we can avoid any school closures, honestly. However, we may need to consider wearing masks intermittently if we get another surge. I hope we don't need to, but it's a possibility that this would happen. Uh, and then there's other things you're going to be doing too. So right now with the surge of pre-testing, for example, uh, we're going to get together with some family friends. Uh, they have a newborn granddaughter uh, who hasn't been vaccinated yet. So we're going to go get rapid tests before we go visit just to decrease the chances that we might spread it to her. Uh, eating outside, I had been eating inside up until the last uh, few weeks, but now with the last surge, uh, my wife and I were defaulting to eating outside. We did the taco ride out to Eagle yesterday. We ate outside at Bailey's Local. We didn't actually didn't eat inside because I think that's just going to decrease your, your chances of getting infected. Uh, I've got better things to do than be home and be at sick, and I've got trips coming up, and I don't want to miss them. So I think these are my combinations. Boosters, uh, masks uh, for certain indications, pre-testing so I don't expose people I care about, uh, especially infants or, or elderly, and then eating out side, I think right now is probably a better default until this wave passes. Uh, for those who are interested too, our HealthyNebraska.org site went live last week. So if you want to look at some of these, uh, some of the data trends for Nebraska that they're actually on, you can click Interactive Data and go look at some of those things if you're interested. Uh, but hopefully this is helpful to you again. Uh, this is what I do for a living, but disclaimer, these are my opinions, not necessarily those of the places I work for, but these are the places I work with and for, so you kind of know where I'm coming from.